Okay, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, what we're going to start on this week is a discussion of the digestive system. So this is chapter 24. And what you're looking at here is actually a transverse section through the upper abdominal pelvic region. And if you look very closely, you can see some of the major structures that we'll discuss. You can pick up the liver here. Uh, you can pick up a little bit of the uh, stomach around here. And if you look very closely, you can also see a bit of the esophagus. So what is the function of the digestive system? It's basically to facilitate the mechanical and chemical breakdown of macronutrients and also, we should mention, micronutrients. That would be your fats, your carbohydrates, and your proteins into their component building blocks. The uh, fats are going to be broken down into glycerol and free fatty acids and reassembled into structures called chylomicrons, which will enter unusual-looking derivatives of the lymphatic system called lacteals, where they'll be transported eventually up to the venous return near the right and left subclavian veins and then eventually find their way to the liver. And then the proteins will be broken down into their component parts, the amino acids and the polysaccharides, the complex carbohydrates, will be broken down into simple sugars. And it's only in that form that they can cross the lining of the digestive system and make their way into the blood. And from there, the nutrients will be routed to the liver through the hepatic portal vein, which will then adjust the nutrient content of the blood by either storing the nutrients for later use as fats or as glycogen, or by passing them on to the rest of the body via the hepatic vein into the inferior vena cava so that we can use those nutrients to generate energy. The digestive tract is called the alimentary canal, and it's a continuous route from the mouth to the anus. It technically refers to the stomach and the intestines if we talk about the GI tract. And there are accessory organs we need to be aware of, and these include the gallbladder, the liver, the pancreas, the salivary glands, the teeth, the tongue. Um, there are um, different regions of the digestive system that we are going to break apart when we discuss the entire root from mouth to anus. The mouth of the oral cavity contains salivary glands and tonsils, which of course guard the entrance of the throat, protecting us against invasion by pathogens. The pharynx, which is the throat proper, is a tubular, lined with tubular mucous glands. Remember that the pharynx has three regions, the nasopharynx behind the nose, the oropharynx behind the mouth, and the laryngeopharynx behind the larynx. And this is the common chamber shared by air, food, and water. The pharynx bifurcates into the esophagus and the larynx at about midway through the cervical region. And obviously, we're going to concern ourselves with the food pipe, which is the esophagus that connects the pharynx to the opening of the stomach. It's also lined with tubular mucus glands. Now, you might well ask, what's the purpose of the mucus glands in the pharynx and in the esophagus? And it's to provide lubrication so that the food can move easily through the pipe uh, without getting held up. The stomach has a lot of different types of glands that are tubular. The stomach produces gastric juice, which we're going to find out is a combination of hydrochloric acid and pepsin, which is designed to facilitate the chemical breakdown of macronutrients and also serves as a sterilizing um, agent in the stomach to cut down on the number of pathogens that are going to be piped into the small intestine, which is the next stop on the pathway. The small intestine is broken into three parts, the duodenum, the ileum, and the jejunum, um, and the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas are the major accessory organs. The liver, gallbladder, and pancreas all produce secretions that enter the duodenum along with the chyme, which is essentially what uh, the food becomes after it's been treated in the stomach with, stomach, with gastric secretions. Um, all those secretions hit the duodenum at approximately the same time. Okay, so the gallbladder, which contains bile, which acts as an emulsifant for fat, uh, the pancreatic juice, which contains enzymes that break apart uh, proteins and fats and carbohydrates, and of course the stomach contributing 
its component, which is the chyme, the, uh, the uh, liquid that remains in the stomach after the, the bolus, the wet food ball, is acted on by the gastric juice. The liver contributes its secretions via the gallbladder. The liver is actually where the bile is created. The gallbladder simply stores and concentrates the bile so that it's a more effective detergent. And the purpose, of course, of this detergent is to take the, the oily component in our diet, the fats and the oils, to break them apart into tinier um, globules, and that provides more surface area for the enzyme lipase to affect chemical digestion of the fat in our diet. The large intestine is the next part of the trip, and it includes the cecum, the three parts of the colon, which are the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, rather four parts, and the rectum and the anal canal, which mark the end of the entire trip. Um, the colon's lined also with mucus glands. This is, again, to lubricate the fecal material so that it's easier to pass, and of course the anus marks the end of the trip. Now, the voluntary part of digestion ends after we chew and we swallow. After that, essentially the movement of food through the pipe goes on autopilot via a sequence of muscular contractions in the smooth muscle that lines the tract called peristalsis. Ingestion describes the introduction of food uh, into the stomach, Mastication is the mechanical processing of food in the oral cavity. This is chewing. Remember that chemical digestion works best when we have a lot of surface area, so mechanically breaking down the food is going to facilitate chemical digestion. And then propulsion is accomplished by two processes, deglutition, which is the voluntary act of swallowing, and then peristalsis, which dominates most of the rest of the trip and involves smooth muscle contraction that's going to push the food all the way from the, the esophagus through the stomach, from the stomach through the small intestine, from the small intestine to the large intestine, and from the large intestine to the rectum and the anus. Mass movements in the large intestine are the result of peristaltic activity of the smooth muscle that is found in a little strip lining the medial aspect of the large intestine called the tenia coli. Uh, what we'll find as we look at the anatomy of the tract is that um, there's a lot more smooth muscle dominating the, the inferior portions of the esophagus and stomach and small intestine than they're going to be found in the large intestine. And again, uh, the purpose of this is um, so that we don't cause mechanical damage to the lining of the large intestine, while at the same time uh, we accomplish the act of moving the waste material out of the body. So this is just a look at how these contractions operate. A secretion introduced into the digestive tract or food within the tract is going to begin this process near the location of the food. Segments of the digestive tract are going to alternate between being constricted and being dilated. The material, which is indicated here in brown in the intestine, is spread out in both directions from where it's introduced, and the secretion or food is spread out in the digestive tract and becomes more diffused through time. And what this accomplishes um, in the stomach and in the small intestine is it increases the contact of the food with the lining of the gut. And that's important because that facilitates chemical activity that helps to break down the food, but it also, especially in the small intestine, enhances the absorption of these um, chemically derived building blocks into the bloodstream. So the more contact you have with the lining, the more absorption is going to be capable of taking place. And again, the mixing is important because without mixing, the enzymes that facilitate the enzymatic breakdown of the macronutrients aren't going to be effective. Okay? They have to come into contact with the food in order to do their work. Okay, so what are some other functions of the digestive system? Well, there's secretion, where we lubricate, liquefy, and digest the food that we eat. Mucus is secreted along the entire tract, and it lubricates the food and the lining 
It coats the lining and protects it from mechanical digestion and from acid and digestive enzymes. So it's sort of a protective and lubricating barrier. Water is important for liquefaction and it makes the food easier to digest and absorb. The bile emulsifies the fats and the enzymes, of course, engage in chemical digestion. Digestion is both a mechanical and a chemical process. Um, they work in concert. It, you can't really have one be effective without the other. Okay, the mechanical digestion enhances the chemical digestion uh, and vice versa. Absorption is simply the movement from the tract into the circulation or into the lymph. Remember that the amino acids and simple sugars are going to go into the blood while the derivatives of the fat in your diet are going to end up in the lacteals and in the lymphatic system. Elimination is simply uh, the removal of waste products from the body. Once we've extracted the useful biological energy from the food that we eat, there's going to be um, organic material remaining that's not going to be useful in terms of providing energy for the body system, but uh, we still have to get it out of the body, and that's the job of the colon, the rectum, and the anus. We should note that there are bacteria resident in this part of the GI that will facilitate chemical breakdown of the fecal material. They can use the, our waste products as fuel while at the same time providing benefits for us in the form of the production of B vitamins and vitamin K, which are critical in processes such as blood clotting and also in metabolism. So let's take a look at the organs of digestion. The primary functions of the digestive system are the breakdown of food, called digestion, and absorption of nutrients. Digestion begins in the mouth, where the teeth break food into smaller particles during mastication. Salivary glands, located near the oral cavity, secrete saliva, which begins chemical digestion and keeps the food moist. As food is swallowed, the soft palate blocks the upper pharynx to prevent food from entering the nasal cavity, and multiple voluntary muscles in the face, neck, and tongue contract, pushing food particles through the pharynx. The food passes over the epiglottis, which prevents food entry into the respiratory system, and then into the esophagus, which connects the pharynx to the stomach. The one-way movement of the food mass, now called a bolus, is controlled by wave-like involuntary muscle contractions. This movement is known as peristalsis. The bolus now enters the stomach. Folds in the stomach wall, called rugae, allow for expansion as the stomach fills. Stomach cells secrete hydrochloric acid pepsinogen, and various regulatory hormones that chemically digest the bolus. Muscular contractions in the stomach churn its contents to further break down the bolus and mix it with stomach secretions to form a thick liquid called chyme. Chyme exits the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and enters the small intestine, the major site of nutrient absorption. The small intestine consists of three parts the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Bile from the liver and digestive enzymes from the pancreas empty into the duodenum to aid in digestion. Absorbed nutrients pass from the lumen of the small intestine into blood and lymph. Chyme not absorbed in the small intestine enters the large intestine. As it passes through the cecum and ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, water and salts are absorbed and chyme is converted into feces. The rectum stores feces until nervous stimulation initiates the defecation reflex, resulting in elimination through the anal canal. Okay, if we look at the digestive tract, what we find again is a conglomeration of tissues that do something as a team that the individual tissues couldn't accomplish on their own. The mucosa is the innermost layer, and it's made up of a mucous epithelium, which under the scope would appear stratified squamous in the mouth and the oropharynx, as well as in the upper esophagus and the anal canal, and simple columnar 
in the rest of the tract. The purpose, again, of that choice for the mucosa is it provides a seal between the lumen of the tube and the rest of the body, and that is going to impede the movement of pathogens from the tract into the deeper tissues, which is important. In addition, um, the choice particularly of stratified squamous epithelium in the regions indicated is it's less likely to rupture due to mechanical wear and tear. By the time we get to the, um, the rest of the tract, the stomach and the uh, small intestine and the large intestine, the food has been uh, significantly uh, broken down mechanically and chemically to the point where um, it's not going to have nearly the, um, the abrasive wear and tear that the initial part of the tract experiences when we ingest. Okay, so that's again why we choose the simple columnar in the distal regions of the tract. Underneath the mucosa is a loose connective tissue, the lamina propria, which adheres to the submucosa. Um, and again, remember that this is simply the body's way of attaching tissues to each other is by using these connective tissue layers. The muscularis mucosa is a tiny uh, area of smooth muscle that lies just beneath the mucosa and its purpose is to cause movement in the tract, um, particularly the movement of finger-like projections that are called villi. Okay, so um, again, the purpose of this movement is to increase contact of the food with the lining of the GI and that's going to facilitate absorption. And once the food, of course, is chemically and mechanically broken down to the point where it can cross the lining of the gut and get into the bloodstream. The submucosa is a thick connective tissue layer. It's got nerves and blood vessels and uh, small glands. It's uh, innervated by a submucosal plexus, and it also contains a significant amount of lymphatic tissue. And, of course, the purpose of the lymphatic tissue is to intercept any pathogens that might manage to penetrate the mucosal lining before they get a chance to enter the bloodstream. So we have to always station our lymphatic tissue where it's most likely to come into contact with pathogens. The muscularis is two or three layers of smooth muscle, two of which are circular uh, and longitudinal. The exception is the esophagus, where the upper third is striated. This layer also contains the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexi, which together are called the enteric or intramural plexus. The term intramural just means within the walls. These are important in the control of both movement, so they help to initiate peristalsis, and they also trigger secretion. The serosa is just the connective tissue outer layer uh, which is there to attach the organ to the surrounding tissue. Um, where serosa is present, we call this the visceral peritoneum, and where the adventitia is present, the connective tissue blends with the connective tissue surrounding it. So what we see here is connective tissue, we see smooth muscle, we see nerve tissue, and we, of course, see epithelial tissue. The connective tissue purpose, again, is to seal the other layers together and also to attach the organ to the surrounding structures. The purpose of the smooth muscle is to provide propulsion. The purpose of the nervous tissue is to initiate propulsion um, and also to initiate secretion. And the purpose of the epithelial tissue is to provide a barrier and also to produce secretions that are going to facilitate lubrication and chemical digestion of the food. So that's the skinny. Um, basically, almost anywhere you look along the tract, you're going to see these layers working in tandem. Okay, so how do we regulate the behavior of the digestive system? Well, nervous regulation occurs through uh, enteric uh, nervous control. There's different types of neurons, which include sensory and motor and inner neurons, and they coordinate peristalsis and they regulate local reflexes. And then there's general regulation where we coordinate with the central nervous system to initiate reflexes due to the sight, smell, or the taste of food. This is primarily parasympathetic innervation. 
um, sympathetic input is going to inhibit muscle contraction to cut down on GI motility. It's also going to reduce secretion and decrease blood flow into the tract. There's also chemical regulation. There's the production of hormones that will essentially serve to prepare um, distal parts of the tract, well, let's say inferior parts of the tract, for the arrival of food and to inhibit processes in um, uh, superior parts of the tract, okay, as we move from the mouth to the anus. So the, the watchword here is um, stimulate ahead and inhibit behind. And a couple of the enzyme or the uh, hormones that do this include gastrin and secretin. The production of paracrine chemicals such as histamine help local reflexes in the enteric nervous system control the conditions of the internal environment of the GI uh, by setting things such as pH levels. Um, we're going to find out, for instance, when we talk about the stomach, that the pH of the stomach is rather low. It's around 2. Well, the pH in the duodenum, prior to the entry of the chyme, is rather high due to the production of bicarbonate by the pancreas. So, again, all of this is coordinated by these paracrine and hormone messengers. Okay, the peritoneum is essentially connective tissue which anchors the entire system to the surrounding walls. Uh, the visceral peritoneum is going to cover the organs while the parietal peritoneum covers the interior surface of the body. Organs that are retroperitoneal lie behind the dorsal wall of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, they're covered by peritoneum on one surface and are considered to be behind it. These include the kidneys, the pancreas, and the duodenum. And then there's mesenteries, which are layers of peritoneum with a thin layer of loose connective tissue in between, providing roots for nerves, blood vessels, and lymphatics to pass from the body wall to the organs that they serve. The greater omentum is a large swath of connective tissue that hangs like an apron in front of the large and small intestine, and it connects the greater curvature of the stomach to the transverse colon. It often accumulates considerable amount of subcutaneous fat. Um, it's one of the um, organs that is removed in the process known as liposuction. The lesser omentum connects the lesser curvature of the stomach and the proximal part of the duodenum to the liver and to the diaphragm. Transverse mesocolon, the sigmoid mesocolon, and the mesopendix anchor those regions to the lateral and posterior body walls. And there are also ligaments that run through these connective tissues, such as the coronary ligament that runs the route between the liver and the diaphragm. Uh, it's a remnant, actually, of the blood supply that provided oxygen and nutrients when we were in development in our mother's womb. Now is um, atrophy to the point where it's simply connective tissue. Now, if we didn't have these anchoring, le anchoring layers, what would happen is that the, the GI could potentially twist and turn and impede the movement of food uh, from point A to point B. The falciform ligament is between the liver and the anterior body uh, abdominal wall, again, um, to anchor the organ so that it, we don't impede its secretions and or uh, potentially impede the movement of food through the tract. So let's start with a discussion of the oral cavity, your mouth, where it all begins. It's bounded by the lips anteriorly, these are the labia. Uh, fauces are the openings into the pharynx posteriorly, okay, so you can see those in the back indicated by the dotted line. And the vestibule is the space between the lip and the cheeks, and the alveolar processes, of course, uh, house the teeth. The vestibule, um, for instance, is where we used to um, put uh, tobacco products like skull, right, between your cheek and your gum, okay in between the lower lip and the gum or the upper lip and the gum. Um, the alveolar processes are simply the tooth sockets and the teeth lie in them anchored by periodontal ligaments 
forming um, special type of slightly movable joint called a gomphosis. The oral cavity proper is medial to the alveolar processes and is lined with moist stratified squamous epithelium. The purpose again to lubricate the food as it moves through the oral cavity but also it serves as an ample mechanical barrier to keep the lining of the oral cavity from rupturing when we engage in voluntary digestion. Okay, the lips and the cheeks are structures that are important both in mastication and in speech. The lips are um, put into motion by the, the circular muscles surrounding the oral cavity called the orbicularis oris. Um, keratinized stratified squamous exterior is thin and the color of blood in the dermis gives it the red pink color that we associate with the labia. The labial frenula is simply the mucus fold that attaches the lip to the gum. You've got a superior and inferior labial frenulum that anchor the upper and lower lips. And there's also facial muscles that act to move the lips. Examples include the depressor labii inferioris, uh, the zygomaticus, uh, the levator labii superioris, and so forth. The cheeks are the lateral walls of the oral cavity. The buccinator muscle, which is important in sucking and blowing, is also important in digestion. And there's also a buccal fat pad uh, that lies in the subcutaneous region of the cheek. Okay, uh, the palate is formed anteriorly by the maxilla, anterior two-thirds are formed by the palatine processes of this bone, and the posterior third is formed by the palatine bone. And then posterior to the hard palate is the soft palate, which terminates in the uvula. This projects from the back end of the soft palate. It looks a little bit like a, a boxer's speed bag, if you've ever seen them uh, train for a match. The palatine tonsils are on the lateral walls of the fauces, and again, the purpose of the tonsils, both the sublingual, the palatine, and the pharyngeal tonsils, is to guard the pharynx against the entry of pathogens into the deeper tissues of the body. The tongue is a muscle with a free anterior surface and an attached posterior surface. This would be the lingual frenulum that holds the tongue to the bottom of the oral cavity. And it's covered with moist stratified squamous epithelium. The intrinsic muscles of the tongue cause it to change shape and the extrinsic muscles protrude or retract the tongue and move it from side to side. The lingual frenulum, of course, attaches it to the base of the oral cavity, and the terminal sulcus is a groove that divides the tongue into an anterior two-thirds and a posterior third. The anterior portion of the tongue is lined with papillae, some of which contain taste buds on their lateral surface. The posterior portion has no papillae and a few scattered taste buds. There's also lymphoid tissue embedded in the posterior surface, and these are your lingual tonsils. This moves food into the mouth. It also is important in speech and in swallowing. Now, in order to process our food, uh, we have tools. The tongue, the cheeks, the lips are just part of the toolbox in the oral cavity. The rest of it is the teeth, okay? And your teeth uh, come in two sets. There are the deciduous teeth, uh, which number... Uh, 20 and they are lost at the end of childhood and then your permanent teeth which number 32 and they come in different shapes there are the incisors the canines the premolars and the molars okay um, the incisors are chisel shaped and they're for slicing the canines are your fangs and they're for slashing and the premolars and the molars are there for grinding this is the mouth of an omnivore, okay? This is nature telling you what your diet should consist of. Bottom line, um, you should eat equal parts meat and vegetable and fruit, and that's because we have the dentition to deal with that. If you look at the mouth of our herbivore, uh, what you'll find is that it's dominated by molars and incisors, which are perfect for um, slicing and grinding vegetable matter if you look at the mouth of a carnivore, you'll find that it's dominated primarily by canines, 
and very tiny incisors and very few molars. And that, again, is the dentition indicating you should be eating raw meat. Okay. Also, there are modifications of the digestive tract in an herbivore and a carnivore that you don't see in a human. A cow, for instance, who is a perfect herbivore, has a much longer digestive tract, has four stomachs, and, of course, the dentition to deal with vegetable matter. Well, the digestive tract of a carnivore is much shorter, and, of course, the oral cavity is dominated by tools designed to deal with raw meat. Now, if you look at your teeth, um, they're important as tools to process food. Um, they're involved in mastication and in speech. The crown of the tooth is the area above the gum line covered in the hardest known biological substance, enamel. Um, the clinical crown is termed that part that's above the gum line. The neck is below the crown, and it connects the crown to the root. The neck is the enameled part of the tooth just below the gum line. The enamel is the outermost layer. It's a guard against tooth decay. Uh, bacteria that live in your mouth try to process the food that you don't swallow and use it to generate fuel, and they form a, a, a sort of a deposit on the enamel, which we call plaque. And what happens as they metabolize is that they produce organic acids, which can erode the enamel away. And if they penetrate the enamel and get to the soft dentin, then they can make a relatively fast trip to the pulp cavity or to the root canal, which contains nerves and blood vessels. And the danger, of course, with that is that the bacteria could get into the blood, and that would pose an immediate danger to your health because you'd be septic. The dentin is the living cellular calcified tissue. In the root, the dentin is covered by a cellular bone-like structure that helps hold the tooth in the socket. Okay, you can see here the periodontal ligaments that anchor the tooth, that hold it. Your teeth are slightly movable in your jaw, so we would term this gomphotic joint an amphiarthrosis. The gingiva, which are your gums, are dense, fibrous, connective tissue covered by stratified squamous epithelium. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that the gingiva come into contact with the neck and the crown of the tooth um, at the gingival sulcus, this little groove right here. And what can happen if bacteria are allowed to grow is they can push outward on this gingival sulcus and open up this area near the gum line, and that can provide a route for bacteria to go under the enamel and then penetrate the comparatively soft tissues that line the root, essentially the cementum, and get into the dentin and then head straight for the root canal or the pulp cavity. This is one of the reasons why your dentist always tells you not simply to brush your teeth but also to floss. It's to get rid of the bacteria that can build up in the gingival sulcus in between the teeth. The danger, of course, is that um, if they do penetrate um, under here, the gums can recede and we can expose the vulnerable portions of the tooth and then the tooth may at some point have to be extracted. Um, healthy gums in general should not bleed when you floss them. If they do, um, what you've got is possibly the beginnings of gingivitis, if not periodontal disease. And in the event that your gums uh, become infected, you may end up losing a significant number of your permanent teeth in order to, again, avoid this possibility of the bacteria getting into the bloodstream. So bottom line, brush and floss at least twice a day and avoid this um, degeneration of the gums. Okay, mastication is simply the mechanical process of chewing the incisors and the canines bite or cut off the food, and the molars grind it. The muscles involved include the masseter, the temporalis, and the medial and lateral pterygoids. Uh, the masseter and temporalis are involved in elevation and depression. The medial and lateral pterygoids help with the side-to-side -side motion of chewing. They elevate the mandible, um, and they also allow it to move side-to-side. -side. You also see some elevation and depression coming from the medial and lateral pterygoids. Protraction uh, and lateral and medial excursion are, again, primarily pterygoid action. A little bit of masseter, but mostly uh, it's the pterygoids. 
Retraction, basically the temporalis muscle. If you close your mouth, okay, and you put your hands on your temples and on your lower jaw and you clench your teeth, you can feel the action of the temporalis and the masseter uh, in chewing. The mastication reflex is triggered by the medulla oblongata, but there are descending pathways from the cerebrum that allow us to consciously control it. It controls basic movements that are involved in chewing. Um, one of the things that we should note is that the joint between the mandible and the temporal bone, called the temporomandibular joint, can become inflamed in individuals um, that grind their teeth at night for a variety of reasons. Sometimes when people sleep, they grind their teeth, and this can inflame the joint, and in addition, it can wear away the enamel on the teeth and promote the formation of cavities. So there are medications and mouthpieces that we use, um, such as a mago splint, to try and alleviate this problem. Okay, the salivary glands uh, come in three pairs. There are the parotids, which are the largest and produce a serous secretion. Uh, the parotid duct crosses over the masseter and penetrates the bucinator and enters the oral cavity adjacent to the second upper molar. You've got the submandibular salivaries, which are essentially mixed. They produce both a mucus and serous secretion, but more serous than mucus. And the posterior half of the inferior border of the mandible is dominated by these glands. Their duct enter the oral cavity on either side of the lingual frenulum. And then the sublinguals, which are the smallest and mixed, but they produce primarily mucus uh, saliva. Each has about 10 to 12 ducts that enter the floor of the oral cavity. Okay, so you can see the sublinguals, the parotids, uh, and of course the, uh, the submandibulars. Okay, so sublinguals, submandibular, parotid. The lingual glands are small coiled tubular glands that are on the surface of the tongue, also producing secretions that help moisten and promote the chemical digestion of the food that you eat. Compound tubular alveolar salivary glands generate saliva. They prevent bacterial infection, they lubricate the food, and they contain amylase, which begins the breakdown of starch in the oral cavity. It also helps form the bolus for swallowing. Um, if we didn't moisten the food, we'd have a difficult time getting it down the esophagus and into the stomach. Parasympathetic input causes salivary production. Um, this is also stimulated by conscious perception of food, right? For instance, you walk past uh, the donut shop and you smell the donuts baking, you will notice an increase in saliva production in anticipation of a potential meal, okay? And again, the purpose of that is to prepare the digestive tract for the entry of food um, before it gets there, right? You have to essentially prepare for the activity before it happens, otherwise you're not going to be able to execute the process. So we get the saliva flowing before we put the food in our mouth. Okay, swallowing is initiated in the pharynx. Posterior walls of the oral and laryngeal pharynx contain pharyngeal constrictors that help us swallow. The esophagus transports food from the pharynx to the stomach and passes through a, a hole in the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus, which terminates at the cardiac sphincter, which is the entryway into the stomach. A hiatal hernia is a widening of this hiatus that can cause the fundus of the stomach to pop up into the thoracic cavity, and of course this produces both digestive and respiratory distress um, as the muscles can close around the organ um, and cut off blood supply to that region, and also obviously we're going to have an impact on respiration. Sphincters are essentially muscles that control the opening and closing of uh, entryways into and out of different parts of the digestive system. There is an upper esophageal and lower esophageal sphincter, which we also know as the cardiac sphincter. And then there's a pyloric sphincter that allows the chyme from the stomach to enter the duodenum. And then finally, uh, there is a uh, ileocecal valve, which has a sphincter-like activity, permits um, food in the ileum to move into the cecum, the first part of the large intestine. And then finally, um, we have 
the uh, anal sphincter, which comes really in two parts. There's a smooth muscle anal sphincter um, that's under involuntary control, and of course the external anal sphincter, which we control, that allows the fecal material to exit the body. So the upper sphincters in the esophagus are made up of striated muscle, skeletal muscle, and the lower sphincter is dominated by smooth muscle. The mucosa is moist stratified squamous epithelium and it produces a thick layer of mucus as well. Swallowing follows three phases. There's the voluntary phase where the bolus of food is moved by the tongue from the oral cavity into the pharynx. There's the uh, pharyngeal phase which is basically a reflex. It's controlled by the swallowing center in the medulla. The soft palate elevates the upper esophageal sphincter which uh, relaxes, the elevated pharynx opens the esophagus, the food is pushed into the esophagus by the pharyngeal constrictors, successive contraction from the superior to inferior aspect, and then the epiglottis is tipped posteriorly from the pressure of the bolus to keep food from getting into the trachea, and then the larynx is elevated to prevent the food from passing into the larynx. The esophageal reflex is involved in the stretching of the esophagus that causes the enteric nervous system to initiate peristalsis so that we can push the food ultimately down into the stomach. So let's take a look at the three phases of swallowing and then I will join you for the next podcast. Thank you. Swallowing or deglutition is the process by which food passes from the mouth to the stomach. This movement is controlled by the nervous system and involves both voluntary and involuntary muscle contractions. Before food is swallowed, it is mechanically broken down in the mouth by chewing or mastication. The salivary glands secrete the enzymes lingual lipase and salivary amylase. Salivary amylase begins the chemical breakdown of starch, carbohydrates, in the mouth. The water content of saliva helps bind particles together to form a bolus that can be swallowed. Swallowing occurs in three stages. The first is a voluntary phase called the buccal or oral transit phase. Here the tongue moves upwards and backwards against the hard and soft palates to push the bolus into the oropharynx. Next is the pharyngeal stage, in which involuntary movements push the bolus through the pharynx and into the esophagus. Movement of the bolus stimulates receptors in the oropharynx, which send impulses to the deglutition center in the medulla oblongata and the lower pons of the brainstem. The brain signals the soft palate and uvula to close off the nasopharynx and the epiglottis to seal off the larynx. This prevents the bolus from entering the respiratory tract. The upper esophageal sphincter relaxes to allow the bolus to move into the esophagus and contracts to reduce backflow into the pharynx. In the final esophageal stage, the bolus is pushed onward by peristalsis a progression of involuntary wave-like contractions of the circular and longitudinal smooth muscles of the esophagus. As the bolus approaches the end of the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes and the bolus moves into the stomach. So, in summary, food moves from the mouth through the oropharynx and esophagus and then into the stomach.